Alfred the Great was a young man, three and twenty years of age, when he became king. Twice in his childhood, he had been taken to Rome, where the Saxon nobles were in the habit of going on journeys which they supposed to be religious, and, once, he had stayed for some time in Paris. Learning, however, was so little cared for, then, that at twelve years old he had not been taught to read, although, of the sons of King Ethelwulf, he, the youngest, was the favorite. But he had, as most men who grow up to be great and good are generally found to have had, an excellent mother, and, one day, this lady, whose name was Osberga, happened, as she was sitting among her sons, to read a book of Saxon poetry. The art of printing was not known until long and long after that period, and the book, which was written, was what is called illuminated, with beautiful bright letters, richly painted. The brothers admiring it very much, their mother said, I will give it to that one of you four princes who first learns to read. Alfred sought out a tutor that very day, applied himself to learn with great diligence, and soon won the book. He was proud of it, all his life. This great king, in the first year of his reign, fought nine battles with the Danes. He made some treaties with them too, by which the false Danes swore they would quit the country. They pretended to consider that they had taken a very solemn oath, in swearing this upon the holy bracelets that they wore, and which were always buried with them when they died, but they cared little for it for they thought nothing of breaking oaths and treaties too, as soon as it suited their purpose, and coming back again to fight, plunder, and burn, as usual. One fatal winter, in the fourth year of King Alfred's reign, they spread themselves in great numbers over the whole of England, and so dispersed and routed the king's soldiers that the king was left alone, and was obliged to disguise himself as a common peasant, and to take refuge in the cottage of one of his cowherds who did not know his face. Here, King Alfred, while the Danes sought him far and near, was left alone one day, by the cowherd's wife to watch some cakes which she put to bake upon the hearth. But, being at work upon his bow and arrows, with which he hoped to punish the false stains when a brighter time should come, and thinking deeply of his poor unhappy subjects whom the Danes chased through the land, his noble mind forgot the cakes, and they were burnt. What? said the cowherd's wife, who scolded him well when she came back, and little thought she was scolding the king, you will be ready enough to eat them by and by, and yet you cannot watch them, idle dog. At length, the Devonshire men made head against a new host of Danes who landed on their coast, killed their chief and captured their flag, on which was represented the likeness of a raven, a very fit bird for a thievish army like that, I think. The loss of their standard troubled the Danes greatly, for they believed it to be enchanted, woven by the three daughters of one father in a single afternoon and they had a story among themselves that when they were victorious in battle, the raven stretched his wings and seemed to fly, and that when they were defeated, he would droop. He had good reason to droop, 
Now, if he could have done anything half so sensible, for, King Alfred joined the Devonshire men, made a camp with them on a piece of firm ground in the midst of a bog in Somersetshire, and prepared for a great attempt for vengeance on the Danes, and the deliverance of his oppressed people. But, first, as it was important to know how numerous those pestilent Danes were, and how they were fortified, King Alfred, being a good musician, disguised himself as a glee man or minstrel, and went, with his harp, to the Danish camp. He played and sang in the very tent of Guthrum the Danish leader, and entertained the Danes as they caroused. While he seemed to think of nothing but his music, he was watchful of their tents, their arms, their discipline, everything that he desired to know. And right soon did this great king entertain them to a different tune, for, summoning all his true followers to meet him at an appointed place, where they received him with joyful shouts and tears, as the monarch whom many of them had given up for lost or dead, he put himself at their head, marched on the Danish camp, defeated the Danes with great slaughter, and besieged them for fourteen days to prevent their escape. But, being as merciful as he was good and brave, he then, instead of killing them, proposed peace, on condition that they should all together depart from that western part of England, and settle in the east, and that Guthrum should become a Christian, in remembrance of the divine religion which now taught his conqueror, the noble Alfred, to forgive the enemy who had so often injured him. This. Guthrum did. At his baptism, King Alfred was his godfather. And Guthrum was an honorable chief who well deserved that clemency, for, ever afterwards he was loyal and faithful to the king. The Danes under him were faithful too. They plundered and burned no more but worked like honest men. They ploughed, and sowed, and reaped, and led good honest English lives. And I hope the children of those Danes played, many a time, with Saxon children in the sunny fields, and that Danish young men fell in love with Saxon girls, and married them, and that English travellers, Benighted at the doors of Danish cottages, often went in for shelter until morning, and that Danes and Saxons sat by the red fire, friends, talking of King Alfred the Great. All the Danes were not like these under Guthrum, for, after some years, more of them came over, in the old plundering and burning way among them a fierce pirate of the name of Hastings, who had the boldness to sail up the Thames to Gravesend, with eighty ships. For three years, there was a war with these Danes, and there was a famine in the country, too, and a plague, both upon human creatures and beasts. But King Alfred, whose mighty heart never failed him, built large ships nevertheless, with which to pursue the pirates on the sea, and he encouraged his soldiers, by his brave example, to fight valiantly against them on the shore. At last, he drove them all away, and then there was repose in England. As great and good in peace, as he was great and good in war, King Alfred never rested from his labours to improve his people. He loved to talk with clever men, 
and with travelers from foreign countries, and to write down what they told him, for his people to read. He had studied Latin after learning to read English, and now another of his labors was, to translate Latin books into the English Saxon tongue, that his people might be interested, and improved by their contents. He made just laws, that they might live more happily and freely. He turned away all partial judges, that no wrong might be done them. He was so careful of their property, and punished robbers so severely, that it was a common thing to say that under the great King Alfred, garlands of golden chains and jewels might have hung across the streets and no man would have touched one. He founded schools, he patiently heard causes himself in his court of justice, the great desires of his heart were, to do right to all his subjects, and to leave England better, wiser, happier in all ways, than he found it. His industry in these efforts was quite astonishing. Every day he divided into certain portions, and in each portion devoted himself to a certain pursuit. That he might divide his time exactly, he had wax torches or candles made, which were all of the same size, were notched across at regular distances and were always kept burning. Thus, as the candles burned down, he divided the day into notches, almost as accurately as we now divide it into hours upon the clock. But when the candles were first invented, it was found that the wind and draughts of air, blowing into the palace through the doors and windows, and through the chinks in the walls, caused them to gutter and burn unequally. To prevent this, the king had them put into cases formed of wood and white horn. And these were the first lanthorns ever made in England. All this time, he was afflicted with a terrible unknown disease which caused him violent and frequent pain that nothing could relieve. He bore it, as he had borne all the troubles of his life, like a brave good man, until he was fifty-three years old, and then, having reigned thirty years, he died. He died in the year 901, but, long ago as that is, his fame, and the love and gratitude with which his subjects regarded him, I freshly remembered to the present hour. In the next reign, which was the reign of Edward, surnamed the Elder, who was chosen in council to succeed, a nephew of King Alfred troubled the country by trying to obtain the throne. The Danes in the east of England took part with this usurper, perhaps because they had honored his uncle so much, and honored him for his uncle's sake, and there was hard fighting, but, the king, with the assistance of his sister, gained the day, and reigned in peace for four and twenty years. He gradually extended his power over the whole of England, and so the seven kingdoms were united into one. When England thus became one kingdom, ruled over by one Saxon king, the Saxons had been settled in the country more than 450 years. Great changes had taken place in its customs during that time. The Saxons were still greed eaters and great drinkers, and their feasts were often of a noisy and drunken kind, but many new comforts and even elegances had become known, and were fast increasing. 
hangings for the walls of rooms, where, in these modern days, we paste up paper, unknown to have been sometimes made of silk, ornamented with birds and flowers in needlework. Tables and chairs were curiously carved in different woods, were sometimes decorated with gold or silver, sometimes even made of those precious metals. Knives and spoons were used at table, golden ornaments were worn, with silk and cloth, and golden tissues and embroideries, dishes were made of gold and silver, brass and bone. There were varieties of drinking horns, bedsteads, musical instruments. A harp was passed round, at a feast, like the drinking bowl, from guest to guest, and each one usually sang or played when his turn came. The weapons of the Saxons were stoutly made and among them was a terrible iron hammer that gave deadly blows, and was long remembered. The Saxons themselves were a handsome people. The men were proud of their long fair hair, parted on the forehead, their ample beards, their fresh complexions, and clear eyes. The beauty of the Saxon women filled all England with a new delight and grace. I have more to tell of the Saxons yet, but I stop to say this now, because under the great Alfred, all the best points of the English Saxon character were first encouraged, and in him first shown. It has been the greatest character among the nations of the earth. Wherever the descendants of the Saxon race have gone, have sailed, or otherwise made their way, even to the remotest regions of the world, they have been patient, persevering, never to be broken in spirit, never to be turned aside from enterprises on which they have resolved. In Europe, Asia, Africa, America, the whole world over, in the desert, in the forest, on the sea, scorched by a burning sun, or frozen by ice that never melts, the Saxon blood remains unchanged. Wheresoever that race goes, there, law, and industry, and safety for life and property, and all the great results of steady perseverance, are certain to arise. I pause to think with admiration, of the noble king who, in his single person, possessed all the Saxon virtues, whom misfortune could not subdue, whom prosperity could not spoil, whose perseverance nothing could shake who was hopeful in defeat, and generous in success, who loved justice, freedom, truth, and knowledge, who, in his care to instruct his people, probably did more to preserve the beautiful old Saxon language, than I can imagine. Without whom, the English tongue in which I tell this story might have wanted half its meaning. As it is said that his spirit still inspires some of our best English laws, so, let you and I pray that it may animate our English hearts, at least to this, to resolve, when we see any of our fellow creatures left in ignorance, that we will do our best, while life is in us, to have them taught, and to tell those rulers whose duty it is to teach them, and who neglect their duty, that they have profited very little by all the years that have rolled away since the year 901.
and that they are far behind the bright example of King Alfred the Great. Example of King Alfred.